How's it going everyone? Ben here, uh, your internet doctor dad that cares about you. And today we are in another vlog and I am actually uh, a week before I have a vacation. So I'm very, very excited, but also I got to get my place together. I'm home a little bit early uh, from work because we didn't really have that much business going on. Um, but we have quite a bit to do and my job is to uh, clean up all the nasty dishes that have accumulated in the week and uh, just get my place ready before I have um, to drive down to Atlanta this weekend. Something else that I want to note before um, I go on for the rest of this vlog is the way I speak about um, my job is going to be different uh, from here on out uh, but at the end of the day, I'm still a doctor. I do a lot of doctor things. So I'll be talking about how like like I've always done in my YouTube channel. I never gave specific medical advice or share specific stories. But um, I will talk about what it means to be a doctor, what it means to be a psychiatrist and how uh, my, my methodology of, you know, advancing health equity for everyone. But the reason why I have to do this is because unfortunately, um, and I'll also not be mentioning any like organizations I work for uh, unless that organization like has a big social media influence is, and is okay with me doing that. And that's because uh, certain policies are in effect, which limits my ability to be vulnerable with y'all. It, it sucks and I don't like it, but at the same time, like, um, I want to end up one day taking care of you all and not be bogged down by these organizational uh, roadblocks that exist. But at the same time, I have to I have to protect myself and um, I'm already pretty isolated. I'm not going to lie. I feel like I can't really trust a lot of people. And I feel like I constantly have to protect myself and this is the way I have to do it unfortunately because I don't think other people are actually advocating for me. Especially people in power that um, I should be looking up to. Um, but these people have other motivations. But I mean, what did I expect? Because uh, literally that has never happened. Uh, for me in my entire life, no matter in what avenues, whether social, organizational, institutional um, area I've ever navigated, educational, academic area I've navigated in my life. And it's not just me, it's a bunch, uh, it's minorities in general and trans people in general having to navigate a world uh, where their existence is constantly, constantly um, told to not exist. So. That's just how it's going to be, but that's not going to uh, water down any of my content because I'm still going to be authentically myself and be vulnerable with you all. Um, but uh, using a language that protects me. Oh yeah, and I wanted to show y'all that I was able to reroute the wire, the Google Fiber wires that John Luke tore down last time in the last vlog that I told you all about. Um, so what I did is I bought extra Google Fiber wires and I routed them this way with clips. I decided not to do over the ceiling again because I'm afraid he's gonna bat at them when he has his zoomies and take it down again. But whenever they're down on the ground, he's not as interested. So I routed this out. No one's gonna know. No one's gonna know. But it's basically, it's, it's, it's a pretty good job. I mean, for someone who's not experienced in wiring like me, I've, been, I've managed to like just scale it down in a similar trajectory just through the ground and then it goes in through that hole. Where is it? Where's the hole? <laughs> right there. Uh, that hole and then it goes to the kitchen's laundry room. And if I open it up, it goes in there, goes out there, and connects to the Google Fiber wiring housing up there. So the only only thing that I I'll need to clean up is these bunch of wires back here because I got the hundred foot. I didn't want to run out of space because for some reason, uh, for some reason Google Fiber wires 
uh, they're hard to cut and then glue together like other wires you can do that there's like systems to put that in place but google fiber wires lose their like um efficiency if you do something like that so i won't be uh, able to do something like that so i have to get a bigger wire if you're wondering how long that wiring process took me uh let's just say <laughs> let's just say it wasted two days of my life um yeah i love my cat i i love him he's my best friend i love him y'all so i need to show y'all something and it has to do with this guy right here but i just sat down to uh read some medical literature because i like being well informed i like learning new things about medicine that's often often not taught in medical school or uh during training and this man <laughs> as soon as i sit down sits on top of my mouse pad and today, today I was planning on um, brushing up on one of my weak areas, which is uh, neurology. And I've learned so much the last couple of weeks because I have been involved in neurology work right now. And um, he just doesn't want me to succeed, apparently. So one thing people ask me all the time is that, Ben, you're a doctor now. Um, you're not in school anymore. Do you still have to study? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, medical school only looks at the basics of the fundamentals of practicing medicine. But because I am specializing in a specific specialty and the fact that within that specialty, I want to specialize even further on certain passions that I have and become an expert in those fields, I have to take time outside of uh, you know work and outside of my general training <laughs> to read up on medical literature and self-educate myself. I also do this so I can educate y'all in my informational YouTube videos. So that's why I take time uh, every day for maybe a, a couple minutes to brush up on uh, new concepts, new topics that I don't see at, you know, during my training usually. And just, you know, just it's just good, good practice uh to be a doctor that does this and it, it ends up benefiting patients in the long run also for the folks who don't know this because i'm sure like many of you who watch my videos actually most of you who watch my videos are not in medicine i have to take um board exams every couple of years after i get board certified in my specialty so let's say i get board certified in like family medicine or psychiatry every like five to ten ish years I have to take a board to keep my specialization and it's made so that um, medicine is always changing. Yes, the stuff that I, cha uh, that I learned in medical school, that will always stay where it's at. That's the fundamentals. But when it comes to advancements in medicine, it literally happens in like months to years. So this allows these board examinations allows me to keep up with the chain emerging the emerging new medical treatments that's have that's arrived but also like it allows me to um specifically focus on not forgetting any of the things that i need to know to practice good medicine because so much of medicine is providing a service but at the same time i need to make sure that i retain that information yes jean-luc is gone so then i can actually study now Oh my gosh, it's like 8.30ish already, and um, I've not really done that much today. Like, I did my little studying after Mr. Huha uh, left, <laughs> and then I cleaned up a little and folded some clothes, but time moves so fast. Um, I kind of want to show y'all one of the books that I've been reading to brush up on my psychopharmacology, which is essentially the fancy word for drugs that we typically prescribe in a, in the psychiatric setting slash medicine and neuro, but mostly psych uh, setting. And there's this really cool book and I wanna show you how intuitive it is because I've never seen a medical textbook that's been this well articulated especially for more visual people like me so it is this is this is technically the bible for a lot of psychiatrists it's called Stahl's prescriber's guide and essentially look how thick this book is it's very thick and it has about 180 70 something um drugs listed in this book and 
The amazing thing about this book is that it tells you indications to use a certain drug, why you should prefer it over other drugs in the same class. Uh, a lot of these things might sound like foreign to some of y'all who are not in medicine, but these are things I consider when I am typically thinking about prescribing a certain medication to a patient. The, um, when it comes to like their lived experience and what they're comfortable with. It also talks about um, side effects, contraindications, why you shouldn't prescribe it to a certain population. And it also like takes into account special populations like the elderly, people with kidney failure and like liver toxicities because not every patient can tolerate a specific drug. So I love this book, but what I really, really, really love about this book is that I've never seen a medical textbook like this, but let me just go to a typical drug here. Yeah, okay, so this, this drug, let me see if y'all can actually see this, first of all, because my camera decided to, uh, okay, so this is uh, for chlorpromazine. It's a type of um, first generation uh, dopamine antagonist drug, which we typically prescribe for people who are going through like psychosis um and um look it's it has these like it's color coded uh each each section is color coded the um the section about therapeutics the mechanism of action which receptors it acts on is blue little icons here like the gear icon here tells me how the drug works like it is so good the half-life Another fancy term that uh, I typically consider when I'm prescribing a medication. It even has like these scales for uh, the side effects, but like let's say that one of the side effects is weight gain. How much weight gain are we gonna be seeing? Um, typically if a patient experiences side effects from this drug and sedation, like if people get drowsy on it. So I, I, I love this book so, so much and it's so intuitive and I wish more books were like this. This is the first book, like medical textbook I've seen that's been very graphic, graphic design oriented. I, like, I felt like they hired a graphic designer to do ethical graphic design uh, to make this book. And yeah, I'm a fan. Uh, and also the doctor who uh, made this book, uh, Dr. Stephen Stahl, this man is like God tier, like he's goat. He is actually a goat in the field of psychopharmacology. He literally knows everything. He can tell you which, which, <laughs> like if you just name us uh, like a psych drug at him, he'll probably tell you exactly which receptors um, that specific uh, medicine hits uh, when a patient takes it. So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to share this with you. I know it's a little nerdy, but I I've never had a like a med like since medical school, honestly, I haven't really read that many textbooks because I hate textbooks. This one, this one I'm gonna read from top to finish in addition to the Diagnostic Statistical Manual version five, which is the Bible for all psychiatrists for diagnosis. So yeah, whoo. Hey y'all, I just got back from work and this was the fit today. I'm really living it up. I'm really living up the fresh doctor vibes but um i wanted to show y'all something lately i've been carrying this bag because i saw one of one of my um my co-workers using them because she's a neurologist and she was carrying all her instruments in 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 a fanny pack and she looked like so cool doing it and i realized i had this i bought this originally uh for my vlog so i can attach it attach the gopro to the to the strap and bring the tripod with me in this bag but i've been carrying um my neuro instruments and my stethoscope in this bag and i'll show you some of the cool things that neurologists use i am even though i am training in uh, psychiatry right now i uh, i don't think a lot of people know this but psychiatrists at the end of the day are doctors so we do need to know how to diagnose medical conditions in addition to psychiatric conditions. No, we do not specialize in specific medical you know, illnesses, but I need to have an understanding of the basic criteria because there's a lot of psychiatry overlap with specialties like neurology and uh, internal medicine. 
So I have to have a good background of that. And you'll know if you ever go to a psychiatrist and you end up taking a specific type of drug with a specific side effect, they'll always run some labs on you. So that is why I am currently getting some training in the field of neurology. But let me show you some of these instruments because I think they're super rad. Also, oh, let me just move y'all up a little bit. Also, super quickie update before I show you all the instruments. Um, quick, uh, quick revert to the old call out to the old vlogs that I've made in the past couple of weeks. I know I dunked on these bars um, in the last vlog where I talked about them smelling nasty, tasting nasty, and I hate them. Well, turns out when you're starving on the job, when you have like large 12 hour shifts and you don't really have time to eat nor the appetite, um, these things taste like um, a, <coughs> they taste like, um, Cornish hen that's been drizzled with um, gravy made with turkey fats and um, decorated with mushrooms that you can't find at a regular uh, grocery store. So yes, I am a huge fan of these, especially when I'm starving. Uh, I'm sorry I dunked on you. Yes, you do taste terrible when uh, life is pleasant, but when you're at work, um, surprisingly, I love these. And uh, another update to the last couple of vlogs that I've done, fig scrubs are amazing, but the, the, those charcoal ones that I was a little sus about, they are super sus. Uh, they're like extremely loose, even though it's the same size as my other ones. So there was definitely a quality control issue there. And that's ridiculous because I spent almost $80 on those scrubs. So um, I know figs is already a pretty controversial brand, but uh, yeah, if I'm gonna spend that much money, on a pair of scrubs, I expect to get good quality every time. Anyways, let me show y'all these cool neurologist instruments that uh, we often use to do specific exams. And the first thing is the classic tried and true stethoscope. Yes, psychiatrists will also use a stethoscope. If you've seen a psychiatrist ever in your life, you probably saw them in an outpatient setting and it was probably for uh, a, a more bread and butter diagnosis like depression. In those circumstances, we will not be using a stethoscope. But like I've said, um, at the end of the day, psychiatrists are doctors. We treat a lot of Jean-Luc, please, please, no, no, no. Back at it. Um, <laughs> having a cat uh, life. Um, but usually we, we use the stethoscope in uh, other, other medical conditions that has overlap with psychiatry. Jean-Luc, please. Please, baby, no. He knows every time I'm talking to the camera that he can be bad because I'm distracted. Uh, but another really cool thing about the stethoscope is that you can actually use the head of the stethoscope as sort of a reflex hammer to test out a patient's reflexes, especially if you forget it. It doesn't do a tremendously good job, but you can. Oh my God, he is going with... Okay, back to what I was saying. So um, for me to demonstrate, and usually this is not recommended. You should only really do it in a pinch because it can damage the stethoscope head and the quality over time if you keep using it and smashing it, it can destroy the tubing. Stethoscopes don't last forever and they don't always work efficiently. So what you do is uh, I'll test it out on my knee, right? So we're gonna test out my knee reflex reflexes and I actually have a pretty strong knee reflex. So I find the tendon that I wanna hit and I take my stethoscope head and I just flick it and it goes like that. I know I know. for some of you, it might seem like I'm doing this intentionally, but it happens naturally when I hit the knee. Um, and that's a really cool bread and butter way to use the stethoscope in a pinch as a reflex hammer. Super cool. All right, next instrument, the reflex hammer. So if you watch uh, TV or the media uh, or like any form of like media television where you see a doctor testing someone's uh, reflexes out, you typically don't see this kind of hammer. You see the cheap one that often medical students get when they are first testing it out. And those ones are usually just for eliciting reflexes in the average individual. But when you are on a neurology service or if you have a patient that requires like really good documentation of whether or not they're eliciting their reflexes, like let's say I, we are concerned for 
par like para paralysis. What if, uh, let's say we, we think a patient's like legs um, are not getting the signals, the neuronal signals down so they can move their legs. Or is it a psychiatric issue? See, another reason why there's like an overlap between the two specialties. So this is when these hammers come in super handy. These are a lot more expensive. So the ones that you probably saw in the media, I'll probably put a picture uh, on TV or something. I'll probably put a picture of. Those tend to be less than $10. These ones, this one cost me about $30. And there are many reasons why it's this way. The construction is sturdy. I mean, there's a solid metal head here. Um, and the the length is longer it has a better ergonomic grip and also you'll also notice that the head is a little different so there's two little dimples here and this allows me uh, to get far more accurate far more accurate reflexes in the area where i'm trying to elicit a reflex also because this head is made out of metal it has a lot more gravitational energy which allows um easier easier force to elicit reflexes. It's actually not about hitting something, someone like this. It's actually about the flick of the wrist. You kind of just let it, let the hammer do its natural thing and it'll bring out the reflex. So super cool thing. Also the point down here, that's to test uh, pain, pain and temperature. So you can put the metal against someone's skin and ask them, is it hot or cold? If they tell you it's hot, Obviously, we need to do some more testing. If they tell you they don't feel anything and it's numb, we definitely need to do more testing. So that's another benefit to this hammer. Another thing that y'all probably don't notice here, but I'm going to show you is this end, this pointy end. I've shown y'all how the point looks right now, but it actually twists off. And when you twist it off, taking it, its time, when you twist it off, it's it's a little brush. Do y'all see this? It's a little brush, and what that allows me to do, it allows me to test for light touch. So I can, I'm not putting it on my face, but <laughs> you can test for light touch um, with this little pin extension. And that's another sensory modality that you test out when you're testing someone's uh, neural, neuronal pathways in, in their peripheral system. So, yeah. Uh, uh, wait, do I have another instrument? Yes. So that's pretty much it for the reflex hammer. And then we have the magic tuning fork. Uh, yes, uh, musicians and music teachers and music class is not the only place. I got some ink on this. It's not the only place where you use a tuning fork. You actually use it. Uh, when you're testing someone's uh, neuronal activity and their uh, signal transduction. And that is because the tuning fork has a lot of different things that you can test a patient's senses with. So obviously the most obvious one is, I don't know if y'all can hear that. You can test someone's hearing. Yes, I hear them on both sides. Another thing you can test with the tuning fork is if you hit it, it's vibrating. You put it on a bony prominence that a patient has and ask them, do you feel the vibration? And that allows us to test vibration sense, which is another form of sense um, that we have neuronal tracks that go down. And uh, the last thing you can do with the tuning fork is similar to this one, but I think this tuning fork does a lot better is you can place it against the skin and you can ask if it's hot or cold. And yeah, actually it's very, very cold. It's a lot colder than that one over there. So yeah, tuning fork, super, super handy uh, neurons, uh, neurologist gadget bag uh, item. Good morning, y'all. Uh, I know I look a little musty right now, but that's because I just finished I just finished uh, this neurology service that I um, did and I start my week of vacation so i'll be going down to atlanta uh for the rest of the week um but i realized recently that my car's tires lost a little bit of pressure and i want to put more pressure in well i've had this air compressor for the last four years it's an excellent air compressor it works really really well but 
Um, unfortunately, what ended up happening during my move when I packed all my car with all that stuff, the, uh, the head broke. So the cigarette lighter head, which honestly, why do these still exist? <laughs> but um, the cigarette lighter head um, broke and that made me really sad because this thing was like 40 bucks. Um, so we're gonna try a little bit of an experiment because I know that these cigarette lighters use 12 volt energy and I have this car battery um, like car battery, you know, charger. That's also uh, 12 volts. <laughs> uh, hopefully I don't electrocute myself by trying to be an electrician with no experience. But uh, what we're gonna try and do is that I tore this apart. So this is, the fuse is no longer in here. And these are the two heads of uh, the cigarette lighter. So we are going to try and attempt uh, to see if I plug <laughs> this in to this and into the charger if the air compressor will work. Okay, so now I have the positive fuse, the fuse on the positive terminal uh, just loosely hanging in there and I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take, ooh, I'm scared. <laughs> Everything's off. Uh, oh, it's, nothing's plugged in, so I won't die yet. Okay. All right, y'all. So I decided to take a little bit of um, sidetrack and just as an extra precaution, I put electrical tape around all the metal parts that I will not have contact with, metal on metal. So I am safe even with wearing gloves. I know this will probably not kill me if I do get electrocuted, electrocuted but let's, 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 be, let's be very, very safe in this process. I know what some of y'all are thinking, Dr. Ben, you are ridiculously ambitious. And that is true. That's why I decided to go into the field of medicine. I want to be an expert in any everything to my own fault. Okay, uh, update. It's been about like 15 minutes since I'm trying to dilly daddle it to see if it was if it works, and it doesn't. I tech, so I am not the um, electrician expert that I thought I was, and people are probably gonna make super super fun of me, but that's okay. Then I tried to go down the wire um, and see if I could expose um, some wiring so I can try a new schematic, and turns out I didn't have a wire stripper, and I was like, okay, I'll use a pair of scissors. And this happened. I accidentally cut off the entire positive uh, copper wire. So <laughs> uh, this idea to try and fix <laughs> was a sham. I wasted like 45, 45 minutes of my life. Nope, probably an hour of my life, uh, but that's okay. Um, we are just gonna buy a new one. This one's already like four years old. So um, it's time, um, yeah. Sometimes, like I've said, I girl boss way, way too hard. And this is one of those times. Alrighty, y'all. It is the day where I drive six, five and a half hours to six hours to Atlanta. I'm already late. I ended up sleeping in when I really wanted to just wake up at 6 a.m. and get to Atlanta by two o'clock to go to my friend Feroza's pool party. But I ended up sleeping till like 9 a.m. So uh, that, th those plans are kind of ruined, but I still have time to get to my friend Eliza's going away party. She's actually going to law school over at CUNY in New York. So I'm just packing as much as I can, as quick as possible. I mean, just putting a bunch of underwear, some swim trunks, some t-shirts, some pants. I'm going to Savannah, Georgia, so it's going to be very beach and very hot. So not taking anything too crazy, just enough for me to get through the week. All right, y'all, that's pretty much it for this week's vlog. Oh my gosh, I'm very, very late. It's noon now, and I wanted to leave by like 8 o'clock in the morning. I didn't realize how much packing I would have to do. Um, I mean, the packing part only took like 10, 15-ish minutes, but my place was a little bit of a mess that I needed to clean up, make sure Jean-Luc had all of his things uh, prior to the babysitters co coming in every day. So it ended up taking so long and then I got lazy and then now it's noon. So uh, <laughs> it's gonna take a hot minute for uh, me to get to Atlanta, but hopefully it doesn't take too long. Anyways, I am so, so excited to be unplugged for about a week and just enjoy my time, not think about anything. And then 
<sighs> just relax by the beach in Savannah, Georgia. So I'll see y'all in the next one. Mwah. This is Dr. Ben.